what I thought I heard in this, and, and it's a definition that I actually I like a lot. Tell me if I'm getting this right. It's the inability of the heart to produce an adequate cardiac output without the expense of a very high preload on the left side. So that right. your, your left atrial pressures go up and your pulmonary venous pressures go up and you begin to transudate and the PA pressures go up. Is that fair? Exactly. So what's BNP? How does BNP measure any of that? All right? Because that, that's a test that we're using. What is, what is BNP? Yeah, I mean, BNP is actually released in response to ventricular stretch, which occurs ah. in the event of increased preload. And so it's going to be released. And it actually counteracts a lot of the deleterious effects of the RAS system and the sympathetic nervous system. So you're telling me that if I have an increased presystolic wall tension somewhere deep in the bowels of the heart, I don't know if the heart is. <laughs> That's a mixed metaphor, Peter. Yes, it is, and I love it. <laughs> um, BNT is, BNP is coming out, right? Absolutely. So you're telling me that my residents now don't even have to listen, they don't anyway, for RALS or an S3. They don't have to examine the patient, just get a blood test and check for BNP, and that's it. Yes? No? It's only one of the, one piece of the puzzle, if you will, because there's, first of all, other conditions or other things that can raise BNP. Um, so it's not necessarily just BNP, but it's BNP in, in addition to the constellation of symptoms that the person presents with. But, but, you know, there wasn't a blood test before, now there is. But I think that's, that's sort of the challenge. I think all of us want uh, to reach for a blood test to make a diagnosis and, or reach for a radiologic imaging procedure. Heart failure is not like that. And in fact, many of us who treat heart failure patients have trouble recognizing it. So I think the more uh, tools we have to make the diagnosis, the more useful it is. And BNP is one of those tools. And like any diagnostic test, Peter, if you're, if you're uncertain about the diagnosis, that's where BNP is useful. There are some patients where it's obvious you have heart failure. They come in, they can't breathe when they lie flat, they're swollen, uh, their heart function is weak on the echo. That patient has obvious heart failure. And then there are other people who are clearly short of breath because they have pneumonia. So it's the patient in the middle where you're a little uncertain whether it's the lung or the heart or something else that's making them short of breath. That's where a high BNP helps you. So Peter, I think what you're hearing is that uh, we all believe you take a history first. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you do a physical, tell that to the house you, office. You do a physical exam, and then maybe you can measure the BNP. No, uh, I'm being facetious, but obviously um, you need all of these things. We, we, I'll tell we you. have to be able to, to uh, incorporate all this evidence. Yeah, we'll and I, I just want to also underscore everything that you've been saying. I mean, I know a good friend of mine, um, Alan Mizell, has always said, you know, BNP makes um, bad physicians worse and good physicians better and it should be used as a tool, not a crutch. I think it's worth um, making clear, because there's some confusion, about the difference between the BNP assay and NT or N-terminal pro-BNP. And, and these okay. can sometimes be confusing, and it, it's worth at, at least bringing this out. So how would you parse that out? What is the difference? Well, you know, there, there are two separate assays, and it turns out that um, depending on which one you have access to at your hospital, you may use the BNP assay, you may use the NT pro BNP assay. The numbers are different. Uh, NT pro BNP tends to be four to six times higher than BNP in, in general. And BNP is a hormone. It, it's actually uh, there for a reason. And uh, as Cheryl said, when BNP goes up, it counter, it, it's uh, an endogenous, one of the endogenous systems that we have to counteract the deleterious effects of renal uh, renin angiotensin system activation. It ain't there by accident. Um, right. Now, okay. NT pro BNP uh, is actually uh, broken off the pathway earlier on. It's inert, it doesn't actually do anything, um, and it can still be measured and is still a measure of the severity of heart failure. They're both very good predictors of outcome, they're very, uh, both very good predictors of um, uh, all sorts of things in heart failure, uh, okay. but they're different, and uh, it's worth uh, being clear about this, and it'll come up when we talk later about right. uh, some of the therapies because they affect these right. differently. I also wanted to add to what Scott was actually saying about uh, the difference between NT pro BNP and BNP, and it's not really a one-to-one -one ratio that we're looking at, and you would think it is, because it's cleaved off um, the BNP to form the NT pro BNP, 
But the issue is that BNP has a very much shorter half-life, about 23 minutes, where NT pro BNP has a much longer half-life, about 120 <coughs> minutes, so it hangs a lot around longer and it takes longer to clear. Is that better or worse? Depends on how you look at it. Thank you for clearing that up. <laughs>